Okay, we are on chapter 10 of Mark. Chapter 10, we left off, uh, or we pick up rather, at verse 17. Uh, we finished the first part of that chapter last week. And just let me remind you how in chapter 9, there was a real emphasis on focusing only upon Jesus. Uh, not our own preconceptions of who He is, but on who He's revealing Himself to be. And there's a big, big difference. And Jesus had to spend a fair amount of time kind of blowing up a lot of the preconceptions of what the Savior would be. And he's still about that task now. Even the disciples are struggling to wrap their minds around it. And I think it's easy for us to kind of sit in judgment of that and say, well, couldn't they see the prophecies? Couldn't they see? Well, they did. And they confessed him to be the Christ. But what did it mean to them? that the Christ had come. That's the bigger question. And that's where they had to have some preconceptions blown up and rearranged. He was not come to be a political Messiah. He was not come to be this or that. And truth told, as we go through chapter 10 and into chapter 11, we'll see how a lot of our preconceptions need to be blown up as well. So just again, quick review. Uh, near the end of chapter 9, uh, Jesus started talking about, uh, again, the perceptions that needed to be changed. He used the word uh, little ones. You have to treat these little ones with great honor and respect. And the word is micron. And you know, it's, it gives us the idea of something that's, to our thinking, tiny and unimportant. But Jesus says, no, these are very, very important. Uh, and then he went on in chapter 10 to talk with the Pharisees while well, they actually started the conversation trying to trap him again with, uh, regarding questions about marriage and their perceptions of a wife in marriage being one of those little things, a micron, an unimportant thing. Uh, and, and Jesus blew up that perception as well. Uh, then where we left off last week, people were bringing little children, the word is babies, they were bringing, the Greek word is babies. They were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. The disciples thought they were unimportant because, you know, they couldn't do anything to help the cause. But Jesus was indignant. And that's one of the few places in the Bible that Jesus is described as being indignant. Uh, and he said to them, let these, and I'm going to just use the word, let the babies come to me. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And here it is. I tell you the truth in verse uh, 15. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like this little baby will never enter it. And then he blessed them. So childlike faith, laser beam focus on Jesus and then blowing up our preconceived notions of how a savior should act and instead calling us to simply trust him and act in childlike faith. So that brings us to verse 17 where we pick up today. Uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your unchanging character. We live under your grace and your favor that you've shown in Jesus, your son. You bore the punishment we deserve, and in you we have new life. So help us to see that clearly, and then to live with childlike faith, for you are indeed trustworthy and do not change like shifting shadows. Help us to see that today and move us to be people who then strive to reflect your image in our lives and in the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have another preconception that needs to be worked on, beginning at verse 17, uh, the rich young man. And, and let me just say this to begin with, because again, I think it's really easy for us, if we've read this account before, to kind of sit in judgment and say, yeah, look at him. Look at him, he's depending on all his stuff. Well, remember what it meant to be rich in that context. I think this guy was beyond it. But the typical definition of being rich in Jesus' day was you had enough clothes for today and a spare set for tomorrow so you could wash them. That was wealth, okay? Um, so by that definition, hey, we're all included. And, and the question then becomes where, well, twofold. Where do we put our trust is kind of the obvious question, but maybe a little more subtle, but worth thinking as well, thinking about as well is, what is it that causes us to think of ourselves as blessed by God or not blessed by God? This man and the people around him would have looked at this young man and his affluence and say, wow, he's blessed by God. We discover that's not the truth at all, okay? So kind of two things working in the background. Verse 17 picks up as Jesus started on his way, right after uh, talking about the faith of a little child, a baby, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now there's a couple of things here that should be pointed out. Uh, first of all, this guy, rich young man, 
uh, pretty affluent, he did kind of publicly humble himself, didn't he? So something's eating away at him. He threw himself down before Jesus. That's not something that a person typically does. I find it kind of hard to imagine throwing myself down in front of a person like that, don't you? And so something's eating away at him. He might have the appearance on the surface of being really blessed, but something's missing, okay? And the word he uses to describe Jesus, good teacher, it's a, a special version of the word good in the Greek language. It's good intrinsically, in and of itself. In other words, it's the word you would apply to someone who's like God, all right? So it's not just he's a nice guy, he's, he's doing okay, but he's almost, he's set apart. That's maybe a way of thinking about it. He, he's very different from everyone else. And then the question, what must I do, action, to inherit? No action there, is there? Eternal life. Um, what must I do to inherit my parents' estate? Nothing except maybe get rid of them. <laughs> They're going to be watching this. Just kidding, Mom and Dad. They do watch it every week. But uh, you know, that, that's a, kind of a weird way of phrasing it, isn't it? What must I do to inherit? Well, you've got to get rid of the person to whom that life belongs now. Uh, and so he's really missing the point on many levels. Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Kind of begs the question, are you calling me God? Or what are you trying to say here? You, you need to be clear on this. And, and he's probing the, the rich young man's anxious thoughts. You know, something's going on there. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. And Jesus is trying to help him get at the real truth of his inner struggle. He goes on to say, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. I am good. He is very self-sufficient, isn't he? And that's the problem. The affluence, the, the sense of self-sufficiency that came out of it left him with a Jesus-shaped void inside of him, a God-shaped void inside of him. And that needed to be identified so he could see where true life is found. So Jesus cuts right to the heart of it. Jesus looked at him and notice what it says, and loved him. You know, constantly you see Jesus' heart going out to people who probably would frustrate the rest of us to death if we were in Jesus' shoes. Uh, and yet Jesus just looks at him with, with unconditional care. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. This is a call to childlike faith, isn't it? You must have a faith like that little baby that was being talked about in verses 15, 16 around there, who's helpless, who simply has to lay there or sit there and wait to be cared for, who's dependent completely and utterly. And in the face of that, this apparently blessed, affluent young man is facing real life struggles because his life just isn't working. It's going off the rails. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work the way it is. And Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. You're not self-sufficient. You think you are, but you're not. Man, do we in Western culture struggle with that, don't we? You know, why is God letting this happen to me? I don't deserve that. Well, you know what I'm going to say, right? Do you really want what you deserve? I don't want what I deserve. None of us should want that. And, and we define blessing on really very shallow and false terms, don't we? Really, we have been blessed. And as we talked last week, I was talking to you about, you know, sort of some ups and downs like we all have that I go through like you go through and, and how I realized through a podcast that I listened to that I was actually choosing to be anxious and miserable. I was choosing that instead of remembering I live under God's gracious goodness and care and choosing joy. And I think I challenged the group last week when I'm starting to grumble and complain to look me in the eye and say, okay, Mark, choose joy. Uh, I actually had to say that to myself one day this week, didn't I? You were there last night. Oh. Okay. So we're choosing joy again, all right? Uh, and, and it's not just uh, uh, positive thinking. It's remembering whose we are. You know that acronym that we use for prayer, ACTS? 
It's the adoring part, the A. It's confessing my need, the C. It's thanking God that he's met that need, and then I'm ready to really live, okay? That's what we're talking about here. So this rich young man needed to face up to what he was really depending on, which was really a house of cards. Verse 22, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad. Why? Because he had great wealth. Yeah, so what was he depending on? What was his life centered on and built upon? Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at this. Um, You know, the word is a word you'd use for almost panicked. You know, it was serious. Uh, It wasn't just, oh, that's kind of cool. No, they were actually almost panicked over this. Uh, But Jesus said again, children. Notice the affectionate terms he uses. Um, he didn't say, you dumb cops, um, you, you grow up, you know, get with the program. Instead, he, it's always reaching out children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And uh, there's a footnote there. Some manuscripts include how hard it is for those who trust in riches. That's, that phrase isn't in the oldest manuscripts. That's why it's only footnoted in our English Bibles. But it certainly gets at Jesus' intent here, doesn't it? Uh, It certainly isn't false or wrong. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because what does our sinful nature tend us towards? Depending on us. Making a name for ourselves. Me being God and making the choices. Being blessed on the terms that I think I ought to be blessed on. Uh, me, I'm at the center, you, you're at the center in your life. And so when you have opportunity to kind of get away with living that way for a while, because you have stashed away, you have a comfortable home and a comfortable life, it can be really, really easy to let the things of God slip farther into the background, right? And, and I think we see that so much in our Western culture. Um, you know, you, you see uh, videos of... Um, missionaries overseas in places where people are absolutely destitute and what do the people look like they're smiling and laughing and happy and here in north america one of the most commonly prescribed medications is the antidepressant isn't it hmm now that's not that's not a negative comment on on anyone who's helped by that i certainly don't mean that but our culture i think really misses the mark in a lot of ways um So how hard it is. Uh, And Jesus again here, notice the disciples are amazed to the point of panic. Why? Well, they're thinking this young guy was really blessed. Look at everything God gave him. So their preconceptions again had to be blown up. And while we might not think of it quite as crassly as that, we do tend to kind of balance things out in our assessment of our own life and think, okay, things are going pretty good on my terms. I'm really blessed by God. Oh, things aren't going great on my terms. Uh, I guess I better get back in God's good books again. Is that how it works? That's not how it works. But that's how we start to think it works. And that's what Jesus is trying to get rid of here. So he's saying how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples are amazed. Verse 26, they were even more amazed. They were exceedingly astonished, is how it is worded literally, and said to each other, who then can be saved? If this guy who was so blessed can't be saved, what about me? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Here's the point. It's got to be laser beam focused, chapter 9, on Jesus, seeing Jesus and only Jesus, having childlike faith in him. He was transfigured on that mountaintop in chapter 9. He was shown to be God with all those fulfillments of prophecies. He's still fulfilling all those prophecies. Don't presuppose that you know what he's here to do. Instead, listen and follow. And that's kind of good advice for us who live in 2021 as well. We have his word. Let's not presuppose how we ought to be thinking, living, and acting, but let's instead make his word a part of our life day by day by day. Think on it, pray on it, talk to him about it, grow our relationship with him, and be like the psalmist who who wrote in Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. You know, recognize me, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Make them clear to me. See if there is any offensive way in me, anything that's leading me off the path of childlike faith and following you, 
and instead lead me in the way everlasting. Um, I, I found that those two verses from Psalm 139 to be just a very helpful thing to run through my head as I'm thinking and making decisions and choices and, and trying to consider even now, you know, again, we're trying to navigate more changes in the pandemic uh, and, and all the different opinions that people have uh, about everything on the subject. Uh, I need to seek the Lord's leadership in all that, and so do you, uh, and in every part of our life as well. The disciples needed to have that presupposition blown up, and Jesus makes the point, it's, it's not possible for you, but all things are possible with God. Now, Peter's response to that is kind of interesting in verse 28. It's a performance response again. You know, it kind of shows where the presuppositions lie. Peter said to him, we've left everything to follow you. I mean, shouldn't it be possible for us is kind of the implied question, right? Uh, shouldn't it be possible for us because look at we've left everything. We've sacrificed it all to follow you. What do we get out of it? Hmm. So if I am following Jesus for what I get out of it, do I have a faith relationship with him or am I a manipulator? I'm a manipulator, aren't I? So he's calling them back to recognize that childlike faith. You know, the little baby, again, that's what he was talking about in the chapter uh, uh, end of chapter 9, or beginning of chapter 10, I guess it was, the, that little baby just trusts mom and dad. They just trust. They, they don't try and, well, they do try and call the shots, don't they? When they learn that when they cry, you come running. They kind of try and call the shots then, and, and the sinful human nature that looks at me first does bubble to the surface already. But they are dependent, and they know it. And that's what we need to bear in mind here, too. Uh, Jesus replied to Peter in verse 29, I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You know, many that we perceive to be at the top of the heap the blessed ones like that rich young man really are shriveling up inside. And many who we look at as the insignificant ones, the microns, they're actually the ones with a living, bubbling, overflowing faith. And don't you see that often in life? The people who seem to have the most alive faith often have a ton of problems. Not always. There are many people God has blessed and gifted with, with material well-being, and they still are able to maintain such a living, wonderful faith and humble life that it's amazing. It's beautiful. But oftentimes, that tends people away from dependence upon the Lord to dependence on our stuff. There's a promise that Jesus gives, and basically what he's saying in verses 29 and following is, Peter, trust me. You know, if you've given things up for the sake of the gospel, trust me, you're going to be looked after. It's going to be looked after, but Peter, there's also going to be hard times, persecutions. That's not the one we put out on the church sign for people to read as they're driving by. Follow Jesus and no persecutions. No, that's not what we put out there. But for people who are in the faith, like those gathered here and those watching, that's something we need to bear in mind. It's not God getting back at you. It's this sinful human world that was opposed to Christ showing opposition to you as well. Uh, and let me just say that applies to you if you are trying to live a life of humble and thankful service to God. It does not apply to you if you are what I like to call a jerk for Jesus. And you're trying to sit in judgment over everyone else and get their back up. And you know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who are living grace-filled lives. The world will push back against that, so be ready. But what's the promise? There's also blessing in the age to come. And what we experience in our however many years here on this side of eternity is just a pinpoint on the timeline of eternity. You've got an everlasting life coming where none of the stuff that we have to face here will be part of your life and experience anymore. So trust, childlike trust. And Jesus kind of blows apart the idea that blessing is always connected to how healthy you are, how wealthy you are, how well-liked you are. He blows those things apart and simply says, follow me, trust me. He goes on to immediately predict his death again. Um, verse 32, 
they were on their way up to Jerusalem. By the way, in their culture, you'll always go up to Jerusalem. And when you leave Jerusalem, doesn't matter what direction you're going, you go down from Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the be all and end all, right? So they were, way, uh, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished. Uh, and what are they astonished over? Well, probably Jesus predicting his death as he's just about to do yet again. He's done it several times and probably still astonished over the conversation about being so utterly dependent upon him. Uh, that they've just been dealing with. So they were astonished. They're caught up in, in human comparison and jealousy, and those who followed were afraid. Why? Well, that Jesus would maybe, uh, um, uh, that he was going to suffer and die, as he'd been predicting. Maybe that made them afraid. I can certainly see that. Probably still afraid over the same thing as the disciples, this call to, to trust him at that level. And he said to that rich young man, give up everything and then follow me and you'll be my disciple. Oh, you know, what if I had to do that? You know, whether they were well off or not, it still would be a struggle and made them afraid. Again, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, that sounds pretty explicit to me. How about you? But remember, we have the advantage of sitting on this side of the resurrection and looking back at the real history of what really happened. They knew death was real. They knew when you're dead, you're dead. Yeah, they'd seen Jesus do some miraculous things, but other people in their life experience were still dying, and he wasn't raising all them up either. So they weren't putting the pieces together, and they still had this idea that he's the Messiah, the Savior. They've confessed that, but what did it mean to be the Savior? That still needed to be fleshed out for them. So we have the real advantage of being able to look back on history. Jesus' words still struck concern, fear, and confusion into their hearts. Uh, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, doesn't this sound odd to you? Jesus has just talked about how he's going to suffer and die. And their first response is, what about me? They wanted basically a blank check. Give us whatever we ask. So their response is one of self-concern again, isn't it? And at one level or another, it's a response that shows they're living in some fear. Uh, we need to be looking out for us first and foremost. Uh, so Jesus says, what, uh, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. Wow. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? You know, can you deal with what's going to happen to me uh, and experience as well? We can, they answered. Performance. It's all performance. He has just said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So, you know, at one level or another, they're almost asking Jesus to raise them up to the level of being like almost godlike. Uh, and, and we can deal with it. We can handle it. Jesus reply, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. You will suffer for the sake of the gospel. And remember, they all did. Every one of them except John was executed for confessing the Christian faith in horrific ways usually. And John died in exile away from everything on the island of Patmos uh, where God used him to, to write his gospel uh, and... Uh, and uh, communicated to the church as well. So you will experience suffering for the gospel, verse 40, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Why? Well, they're trying to get a leg up on us. Or why didn't we think to ask that first? Uh, but it created division again. And, and all of this performance thinking and, and I got to look out for me, it always creates divisiveness in the group. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials ex exercise authority over them. You, you know how human, how human uh, uh, organization works. You know where human beings find their security, you know, in their personal position and in their power. You know how that works. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Why? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know how it works among human beings. Their security is found in their position, their power, or what they have, or those kinds of things. Your security is found in Christ, in me, says Jesus. Your security is found by having childlike faith in me. I've got you, and I'm here, and I'm going to give my life up for you. So he's turning on its head their perceptions of how life works, of how the Savior ought to act, of, how, um, uh, of what really matters in life. And in the process, we're learning a few things too. Uh, because I'm not going to say this, but if I did say to you, give up everything and then follow Jesus. If somebody said that to me, I would go, mm, wouldn't you? That would be tough. That kind of step of faith would be tough. And, and that, that's not what Scripture says to us. But it's still worth asking the question, why would I struggle with that? And then back to that prayer, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, what causes them. See if there's any offensive way in me and instead lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, that's got to be applied to that situation too. And, and then, you know, thank God that, that he is patient with us. All right, uh, where did we leave off here? Uh, we're at verse uh, 46. So we're going to see uh, Jesus moving on and giving his life in, in various ways in the sections here that follow. Uh, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Now the, the parentheses there where there's an explana explanation is one of those things that I told you about at the beginning of Mark way back in the spring. Uh, that Mark's audience was largely Gentile people. Uh, and so he's explaining to them that Bartimaeus, Bar means son of, and Timaeus, well, son of Timaeus. And, and what's the other reason that he's explaining this to his Gentile audience as well as his Jewish audience? Well, the implicit thing, statement is go and ask him. He's been sitting there for years begging. He's still there in Jericho. Go ask him what happened. Let him be a witness to the faith as well. Um, all right, so he's sitting at the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he calls him son of David, what's he saying? Jesus, you are the, you are the Messiah. Have mercy on me. Now that's a statement of faith already, isn't it? We all know where this is going. We all know that what he wants is his sight back, but that's not what he asks for initially, is it? Have mercy on me. I'm leaving it up to you as to how you do that. I think he pretty strongly suspects Jesus could give him his sight back and might. But he's not asking explicitly. He's throwing himself on the grace and the favor of who Jesus as the Savior is. That's a childlike faith. Um, many, uh, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet because he's one of the un unimportant ones, right? He's one of the micron ones. He's one of the ones that we step on and, and ignore. Uh, because he can't do anything to help us out. But he's important to the Savior. And he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he still doesn't get any more, uh, um, what, explicit than that. He still keeps it pretty general and throws himself on Jesus' mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. Oh, NIV, you blew it here. Cheer up. <laughs> Take courage is the literal translation. And to me, that's a little more powerful than cheer up. Um, you know, they're along the same lines, but take courage is what it says. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now just picture that, he's blind. He had to be kind of feeling his way and following Jesus' voice. Maybe somebody grabbed him by the elbow and guided him along the way, we don't know. But he's taking some real uh, literal steps of faith here, isn't he? He could have got hurt. Seriously hurt. Uh, but he's walking toward Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. And now he gets specific. He's thrown himself on Jesus' mercy, and now he's entrusting his greatest need to Jesus, the merciful one. Go, said Jesus, and look at how it's worded. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Go, said Jesus, your faith 
has healed you. It's already happened. But at that split second, the man still couldn't see. So Jesus is talking about a bigger healing than just having his eyesight back. Your faith has healed you, made you whole. And immediately, one of the proofs of that was he was enabled to see again with his eyes. Uh, and he followed Jesus along the road. Um, let's just keep on going. Uh, As they approached Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. So, you're probably guessing that we're moving into what we call Palm Sunday now, right? And that is the case, and so we're within the week time frame of Jesus' crucifixion now, right? He's going to Jerusalem, Jesus knows what's coming, uh, and he has told his disciples already three times that they're going there and he's going to be put to death and on the third day rise again. Um, so he, this is his last visit to Jerusalem then. Uh, and again, he, the, the death has been foretold. This is not happening to him accidentally. This has all been foretold, and he's fulfilling prophecies. So he's showing that he's not here to be a political messiah. He's here to do what he said three times already that we're aware of. Could have been more than that, but three that are reported to us, that he's here to suffer, die, and rise again for the forgiveness of sins and to make it possible for us to enter eternal life. Um, All right, so they went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked just what Jesus said they would. What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. So you've got this encouragement that's given to them. Jesus said exactly that, and that's exactly how it turned out. The, the, The donkey was there, the colt was there, and the people asked exactly what he said, and we told them what Jesus told us to, and and it all played out just as Jesus said. What's the signal? Who's driving the events of this week? Jesus is, isn't he? And by the way, what's he here to do this week as Palm Sunday begins? Suffer and die, willingly. He's driving the events. Now, need to fill you in a couple of things here that you may or may not be aware of. Um, There's a colt which no one has ever ridden. For those disciples, that should have twigged their memory from the Old Testament. Uh, A colt that no one had ever ridden, if it was being used by Jesus for the first time, that was a sacred purpose. This is a sacred thing that's going on here, okay? Uh, And that comes from Numbers and Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Zechariah. It was all over the Old Testament. So the disciples certainly should have been aware of it. Oh, this is going to be something sacred that's happening here. Uh, And then they went and found the colt just as uh, it was foretold. They answered and the people let them go. In verse 7, when they brought the colt to Jesus uh, and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, which means save. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, This is from Psalm 118, by the way, and so is the putting palm branches down on the road ahead of him. They were all uh, signals from the psalm that this was the promised one here, and I'll come back to why that is in just a minute. Uh, So, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, if he's coming in the name of the Lord, whose plan is he fulfilling? The Lord's, right? He's fulfilling God's plan. So, The signal then, especially for the disciples, but for all the others watching the events unfold over the next few days, should be, this is the plan of the Lord. Jesus there being tried, all these false accusations, Jesus on the cross, this is the plan of the Lord. Now, again, it's really easy to sit in judgment over those people and how they responded to the situation when we're sitting on this side of the resurrection, right? We get to see the outcome. They were in the midst of all the fear and the worry. But remember this, in the midst of all your anxious moments, fears and worries now, God still, anything that happens is something that he either allows or that he will use. Work it together for the good of those who love him. So what should our response be? I don't get it all the time, Lord. I don't know why you allow some things in my life or why you even sometimes bring some things into my life, but I know who you are. And I'm going to run what I don't understand through the filter of what I know to be true about you. That's what we do with the people we trust, right? You don't always understand their actions either, but you run it through the filter of what you know to be true about them. 
do that with God. Here he's driving the, the, the events. He's driving the agenda. He's going to the cross willingly. And in the midst of whatever you might struggle with today, he can and will do the same things. And our call should be simply childlike faith. So he's coming in the name of the Lord, God's plan. Blessed is, uh, yes, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. He's a king. He's the promised one. Hosanna in the highest. Now, one thing I said I wanted to mention to you, and I don't want to forget, so let's do it now. Why would he come on a donkey? What do you think of when you think of donkeys? Stubborn? Dirty? A little stinky? My wife is thinking, oh, they're cute like all animals. <laughs> because anything that has fur is cute. Um, <clears throat> actually, that's not even true. Even reptiles are, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Anyhow, why did he pick a donkey? Yeah, what do you think? Okay, that's the key thing. Meek and humble and coming in grace. When the one you thought of as king rode into town on that stallion, he was going to call you to fight. He was going into battle. When he came into town riding on a donkey, and here a colt, the foal of a donkey, that's being used for a sacred pur purpose because it's the first time, add to that the second layer of meaning that he's coming in peace. That's what it meant. He's coming meek and in peace. So how does that fit with the events of what we call Holy Week, where Jesus is unjustly accused, tried, and put to death? Well, that's how he won our peace, right? He, he was, in a sense, coming there to do battle as well, of course. But he was also coming to bring us peace. And, and that's the message by, uh, that's given with the colt, the foal of the donkey, which, by the way, was prophesied in Zechariah as well. So he's fulfilling all these prophecies about who the Savior was. And people are getting it. They're, they're using the Psalms to describe uh, uh, what's happening in their experience, what they're seeing in Jesus, to describe him as the Savior. But do they totally get what it means that he's the Savior yet? No. And again, we can't sit in judgment over that. Uh, because we don't totally get how God's at work in our lives in this day either. But 10 years from now, we might be able to, if the world's still standing, we might be able to look back on it and say, oh, that's what he was doing. And we have the advantage of looking back here, don't we? Uh, they didn't. So I find great comfort in that. You know, uh, I used to kind of think, man, these guys, why didn't they just get it? All the prophecies were there. But the older you get, maybe sometimes you gain a little bit of wisdom and you look at your own life experience and how you've responded to things and you have to humbly admit there were so many times when you didn't really get it either and should have trusted God in ways that you didn't. And you kind of go, oh yeah, this is really a good thing that's reported for us here. Jesus was patient with them. He's patient with us too. So Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, uh, Mark kind of gives this to us in chronological order. We have Jesus checking things out at the temple, going away for the night. There's the business we'll read about of the fig tree, which is a signal to the disciples of why Jesus cleared the temple the next day when he went back. Matthew kind of puts Jesus coming to the temple and clearing the temple together and, and the fig tree he talks about later, but Matthew isn't always chronological, uh, and Mark is more so. So, all right, the next day, they went away, and the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, that's important, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. That's important too, because they're going to see how that came true uh, in a very short order. But I always kind of read this, and, and I thought about it when I was getting ready for today, and I thought, you know, I got to check into this a little more, because I read this, and I'm thinking, it wasn't the season for figs. What are you getting so worked up with the tree over? And, and I'm not that much of a gardener or a farmer or an agrarian or anything like that, but I did find something out. It's important that it says he saw in the distance a fig tree in leaf in verse 13. When the fig tree is in leaf, there are early season figs on it. That should have been there and it wasn't, okay? And that's the reason that Jesus curses the tree. He's not mad at the tree. He's using this as a teaching tool. He saw... Uh, the tree and leaf, and he had a rightful expectation that there, were, there would be early season figs on it, and there weren't. And now he's going to go to the temple where he has a rightful expectation. 
to see the message of God's grace and salvation being proclaimed freely, and it was turned into a marketplace and a circus. He had a rightful expectation to see something, but he didn't. That's the point of the fig tree. And do you want what happened to the fig tree, because we're going to see it in a few minutes, to happen to you, is the implied question. No. So take to heart what Jesus is upset about at the temple. All right, so the tree is cursed. His disciples heard him say it, so it's a teaching tool for them because they'll have it explained later. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Stop there for a second. All right, we've probably all read. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So it can only be a teaching. Yep. Even when he's hungry, he's going to have told me, I'm hungry. And then walk the fig tree, which he does his own face on. Yep. And then you is going to curse the fig tree. Yeah, absolutely right. So it's not that he was hungry and then he expected to have faith. He's not expecting anything. Yeah. Yeah, he know, okay, so the comment was Jesus knew beforehand there wouldn't be anything on the tree, any figs on the tree, so it's definitely a teaching tool, right? Uh, and, and just by, uh, the, the only point I mention expectations for is to say, you know, what would naturally be the outcome of seeing a tree with those leaves should have been figs. And that's the problem with the temple, right? Yeah, so it's definitely a teaching tool. Jesus knew ahead of time there wouldn't be figs there. Uh, perfect, yeah, good point. So, okay, temple area, uh, I want to talk about this a little bit. So Jesus is driving out the money changers uh, and just set the stage for you. You've probably read this a thousand times before, but you, you had to have certain uh, sacrificial animals when you came to the temple. And if you came from a different part of the empire, you needed to change your money into the temple currency, the temple coin. And so the money changers were there to exchange your money at an exorbitant rate, right? If you're traveling somewhere, remember what that used to be like? you know, and you're in a different country, uh, you probably don't go to the front desk at the hotel and exchange your money there, do you? Because you'll get charged a more exorbitant rate, right? And, and that's what was happening in the temple. What was wrong with that? Well, uh, people were basically selling salvation. They were getting rich off people's need to gain forgiveness from God through offering the sacrifices. That's not the intent of the temple. And to even take it a step farther, it says in verse uh, uh, 15, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area, the temple court. That was the place, the only place, where Gentile people who were seeking the living God could come. So in the middle of the only place Gentile people could come and worship, what was going on? It was a gong show. There was noise and clatter and clamor and smelly animals and people rushing around here and there. How were these people supposed to worship? Their ability to worship was basically being taken away from them. Uh, and then uh, later on, the end of verse uh, 16, well, all of verse 16, he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. That temple court was kind of the shortcut for the Jewish people to get from outside the temple to where they could go where it was quiet and peaceful to worship. And so they were creating even more clamor and noise and confusion for the Gentile people who had to stay in that outer area. And those are also some of the things that were upsetting Jesus. And I find it really instructive to see his concern here, not just for the people of Israel, but for all people. It was always intended to be that way. And that idea kind of got lost on the Israelites sometimes too. So he's blowing up another preconception here, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and that very. Yep, yeah, that very well could have been the case. They were reselling sacrificial animals because there was a backlog, and and you're basi basically flipping, right? <laughs> and you're making even extra income that way. And at the times of the big festivals, especially, that was very likely the case because of the number of people coming to the temple, right? So there's all kinds of ways in which they were selling salvation. That was not the intent. Um, so Jesus drove them out, uh, prevented people from shortcutting through the temple courts. In verse 17, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Those Gentile people matter. 
they need to be included too. You can't treat them as micron, as unimportant. You see how that idea keeps coming back in different ways? Uh, you're unimportant if you're blind and you can't do anything for me. You're unimportant if you're a Gentile because you're not one of us. You're unimportant if you're a woman so I can just say I divorce you and you're out of here. You're unimportant if you're a child because you can't do anything to help me. Jesus is taking all those preconceived notions and just blowing them up and, and just pointing to how to him, the Savior, willingly going to the cross, everyone matters. So it's supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Uh, and in, in saying that, he's also quoting, these things were prophesied uh, from Isaiah and Jeremiah. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. We will lose our place and our power, the other gospels report. We, can't, we will not believe in him because if we do, we'll lose our place and our power. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Yet, maybe... There might just be certain things in my life or in your life where I want to, want to say to God, hands off. You know, that is something that's just too important for me to give up. Could be a different thing for any one of us, but it kind of begs the question, are we any different? So again, I come back to search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, right at the end. Uh, it's just a great prayer for all of us. All right, uh, so the chief priests began to look for a way to kill him. Why? For they feared him. Why? Because the whole crowd was amazed, astonished at his teaching, and they were following. Uh, when evening came, they went out of the city, Jesus and his disciples. And in the morning, as they went along, here it is, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. You know, it wasn't just a little infected. It was dead as dead can be. Uh, and uh, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus doesn't really answer what Peter has said. Instead, he talks about faith because that's what was missing in the temple. It was a den of robbers. Um, it was supposed to be a house of prayer. So Jesus gets right to the issue at hand. Have faith in God. Trust me, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he has said will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, that was their usual posture for praying. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You know, forgive us our trespasses. Forgive. Very important. Uh, well, what do you think of Jesus' words here? You got carte blanche, right? Whatever you ask for. What did he say? Uh, in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But remember, all of this is preceded and, and framed up by what Jesus said in verse 22 when he started speaking, have faith in God. Trust him. So if I'm going to do that, I am free to ask him for anything, right? But at the end of asking him for anything, I'm going to ask him to do what he knows is best for me. Have faith in him. Uh, and so, you know, this isn't an opportunity to get that, uh, what, that new Lamborghini you've always dreamed about. This is not an opportunity to, to get whatever it might be, even for things that we might think of as really seriously important, someone's health and well-being. You know, bring those things to God in prayer, but then say, you know, you, you're at work here. You're doing something. And, and I know that you're working for the good of those who love you, so help us to live like that. And just trust him. Have faith in God. Um, scripture also says, I mean, Jesus said, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes, it'll be done. Yeah, there's also something in Scripture about not putting the Lord to the test, right? Because every time I read that, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that'd be cool. Um, but, you know, the bigger question, the bigger picture Living by faith is what's really going on here. Okay, uh, and let me ask you this. If I ask, I'm on verse uh, 24 again, if I ask something of God in prayer that is really important to me and I just leave it with him and ask him to do what is best, have I received it? Yeah, yeah, I'm looked after. That's really what I'm asking for, isn't it? and I will be looked after, and you will be looked after too. All right, Jesus' authority is questioned. We have time to finish this chapter yet. 
uh, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? You know, they never deny that Jesus is doing things, right? Now, of course, they're referring to clearing the temple courts and things here, but they also have to be thinking about other miracles Jesus has performed. Do you ever notice how they never deny, Jesus' enemies never deny that he was doing miraculous things? They just keep asking him, by what authority do you do it? You know, it's by Beelzebub's authority elsewhere in the Gospels. But they never deny that he was doing them. And that's kind of interesting in itself. Jesus doesn't really answer, instead he asks them a question. Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. You know, because you know what they did to John, right? John ended up being executed, uh, and they, they talked down John and harassed John while he was preaching and teaching when he was still alive. But who did John point to? He pointed to Jesus, didn't he? Behold, this is the Lamb of God who is already taking away the sins of the world, living life in your place. So if they uh, say they're agreeing with John, they by default are also saying they're agreeing with John's assessment of who Jesus is, right? So they can't go there. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask then why didn't you believe him? And by default, why don't you believe me? Because John pointed to me. But if we say from men, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know. They couldn't answer. Um, so Jesus discredited them by refusing to answer and by challenging what their life was built upon. Okay? Uh, Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So we're into Holy Week now. And the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scribes, their backs are really getting up. They're, they're getting angrier and angrier. And they are fearful of losing their position and their power. So things are going to start happening very quickly here. But just again, chapters 9 and 10, the main thrust was a laser beam focus on Jesus. And then struggle to understand what it looks like to live in childlike faith. Struggle to understand what we think of as things that are unimportant, micron which really are very important. Struggle to understand what it is in us that moves our attention anywhere away from Jesus. And that's something that each of us should then prayerfully talk to our Lord about and deal with. Uh, because he'll be about the business of blowing up our preconceptions about life as well and teaching us what is real and dependable. Okay. So any other thoughts on what we covered today? Okay, well, let's close there with prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are as well, for your willingness to become one of us, to take on human flesh. Sometimes we rattle off, Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins, and we don't even stop to consider what that really means, that you, the maker of all things, would bend low and become one of us just because you love us and you long to be with us now. So help us to have a heart that longs to be with you. Uh, make us fertile soil for your word and your Holy Spirit, that we might recognize what it is to live in childlike faith, to do so, and thereby to give honor and glory to your name. We ask it in your own name. Amen. All right, we'll pick up next week.
relational problems, emotional problems, spiritual problems. But those problems are really symptoms. The root problem is ears that have been deafened to the voice of God. And if you can't hear God's voice, you can't sing God's song and your life will be off key. Does God speak audibly? Absolutely. But that's a thin slice of his vocal range. When someone speaks in a whisper, you have to get very close to hear them. We lean into a whisper, and that's what God wants. The goal of hearing the Heavenly Father's voice isn't just hearing His voice. It's intimacy with Him. He wants to be as close to you as possible. Why? So you don't just hear His voice, you hear His heart. God is speaking. The question is, are we listening, and is He the loudest voice in our lives.